Previously on Mountain Men. Marty narrowly escaped an icy trap in Alaska's Revelation Mountains. The airplane is your lifeline. Oh, crap. If anything happens to the plane, you're not going back. And in Montana, Rich's lead dog met her match. The branches broke, falling, falling! Oh, Randy! At an elevation of 6,000 feet, the Revelation Mountains lay at the westernmost edge of the Alaskan Range, where they sit exposed to storms that form over the Gulf of Alaska, bringing long bouts of dangerous winds and snow. Marty Majorato has set up camp here on a gamble that these untouched forests might rescue his season. I came out here to try and to find some fur. Right now, I need to make money. Obviously, I don't have the resources to put in a big bunch of line, so all I'm after is just trying to figure out what's here. A river runs roughly straight this way. My camp is probably about here. There's a big mountain range that runs like this, and then goes this way. And then there's the mountains back over here. And this is a pretty broad valley. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put in a snowshoe trail up this valley within this spruce, kind of close to the edge of the river. It's always nice to get back to old school and strap on the webs. Hey, it's clearing up. Awesome. Kind of a greenhorn in this country. Marty will travel his line on foot, so he'll need to cut an efficient route. Picture it like a clover leaf with your camp right in the center. And that's a pretty good trap line setup to where you're not walking out and then walking back on the same trail because then you're, you're not covering new ground. The trap line will wind through the valley's thick spruce forest. Marty chose this area because spruce trees are known to be home to one of Alaska's most abundant mammals. The main thing I'm after is Martin. It's basically a big weasel. It could be up to $200 of pelt this year. And it's the highest it's ever been since I've been trapping my entire life. Marty can only carry eight traps per trip, so he has to make every one count. There's an old adage, set on sign. All that means is that if there's signs of animals crossing somewhere, you set on them. And I think I see a Martin track over there, actually. Well, these could be Martin tracks right here. It's hard to tell. But it's been snowing every day since I've been here, so they're probably not more than a day or two old. Hop, hop, hop. Six weeks into the season, these first tracks are a welcome sign. When a Martin's hopping, and they always hop, I mean, very seldom do you see tracks where they just walk. But uh, when they hop, it just looks like holes in the snow, especially with snow in it. It just snowed, and it's still snowing a little. So they could be pretty fresh. There was definitely a critter here not long ago. There's fur around, so I need to take advantage of it and set some traps. Twenty one hundred miles southeast. At an elevation of fifty five hundred feet. The thin air of the Ruby Valley yields temperatures that can drop to 30 below. Rich Lewis conditions his hounds to thrive in this sub-zero environment. Hey, Dolly. 
so they're ready to face down predators in even the most brutal conditions. Hey, Cricket, good girl. A good houndsman he has a love for his hounds. Well, I take care of them. But my dogs are different than household dogs. They gotta be tough because what they do gets pretty dangerous. That's the easy to get hurt. Rich hunts his dogs as a team, and a pack is only as strong as its leader. He just retired his lead dog, Brandy, and will need to find her replacement among his less experienced dogs. Cold Brandy? Huh? We had a lion incident with Brandy, and she got bit in the shoulder, and she's going blind. So if I can't hunt her anymore, I got to go back to the drawing board and figure out which dog I'm going to use for my new lead dog. It's kind of like going back to the first grade. The two oldest males, Turbo and Capone, and one of the youngest, Hatchet, are the leading contenders for the job. Those three dogs are going to be the main three to see who can fill the shoes of Brandy. Rich puts the dogs through a series of tests that will help him evaluate which one has the right temperament and instinct to lead a team. Turbo seems to be picking up pretty good. He's the oldest dog behind Brandy, so he can move a track out pretty fast. Starting with their ability to stay calm and sniff out leads from the hood of a truck. Hey, Turbo, get up here. When I train my dogs, I want them to strike off the truck because I've got to rely on them to uh, use their nose and smell something. Good boy, Turbo. What's matter, Turbo? You ain't very excited. Huh, buddy? A little nervous. Well, he's kind of scared. I don't think he doesn't like being up there. He's shaking. He just, it just isn't his cup of tea. Some dogs just don't like being up on the hood. They get too nervous, and I got to have a dog that isn't going to be afraid of anything. Come on, Hatchet. Let's see how you're going to ride up here. Come on, load up. Get up there. Good boy. Well, I like the dog on the hood because they're up front and smelling fresh air. The dog in the back is getting the exhaust fumes, the smell from the oil and everything else, so the dog in the front has a better smell. Hatchet and Capone take to the hood with confidence. I'm just getting them both up there to see. They're next to each other. They're not growling at each other. But before the new pack leader can emerge, the dogs will need to prove their tracking skills. Not having an experienced dog like Brandy in there, you know, it could be a dangerous situation. Rich heads into the mountains to put them to the test. But I mean, I got to try to go for it. Three hundred miles away, in the Cabinet Mountains of Northwest Montana, winter's relentless assault locks the valley in a brutal freeze. But with two months of the deepest winter still to come, Tom Orr must brave the cold to hunt for meat he'll need to survive. What do you think, Ellie? It's a pretty important thing for us to get our meat in, and that's what we live on during the winter. To make the most of his hunt, Tom trades in his rifle for a homemade bow. I really like the bow hunt. I guess it's because of the primitive background that I'm interested in. There's a connection there that really appeals to me. He harvests wood for ammunition from a nearby rose bush. Should be a couple arrows and kind of getting down on arrows. So before I could even go hunting, I had to make some. The Kootenai tribe that originally settled the yak used wild rose stems to fashion arrows. Future arrow shafts. Because the wood is lightweight and pliable. With choosing these rose bushes, you pick out the straightest looking ones and you cut them and I make them into arrows. Crafting arrows by hand costs time up front, but they're part of Tom's strategy to make this hunt more productive. Animals killed with a bow, they normally die pretty fast. You usually have lots of damaged meat when you shoot them with a high-powered rifle. With the arrows, you usually don't. He first files them down. You want all your arrow shafts to be the same size around, or else they won't fly the same. 
and then straightens them using an ancient technique. I use bare grease and heat, and you heat these arrow shafts, and you bend them and hold them into place while they cool off, and they'll actually straighten out on you. The Indians used to straighten them by biting them like that and bending them down. You see, you can find lots of old arrow shafts in museums that have the teeth marks still in them. After I get them straight, though, then I have to deal with putting the fletchings on them. The feathers keep the arrow going in a straight line when it's fired from the bow. And then you have to put points on them and cut knocks in the ends of them. I usually paint all my arrows also. The color makes it a little easier to find your arrows, especially in the snow conditions. You'll have a pretty good straight arrow when it's all done. Tom adds three new arrows to his quiver, but he must test their strength and precision before he can trust them on a hunt. So I figured I ought to break out the target and shoot a few just to see how they shot. Hopefully all them arrows are gonna fly straight. Montana's Kootenai River carries a winding path through the Yak Valley for more than 500 miles and supports the local wildlife year round. Tom is on a hunt for winter meat, and he heads to a bend in the river that's a known watering hole for game like deer and elk. There's quite a few deer that move through here. So I'm gonna go check this out. Brush tracks there. I'll step down through here, see what Since we got snow during the daytime, I could tell which tracks were made during the day and the ones that were made the night before because they had snow in them. Right there. There's a couple of them over there. Tom spots two does less than 100 yards away, but he only has a permit to shoot a buck. I got close enough to some does, but the bucks, I just didn't see any. This is right at the top of the breeding season now, so the bucks should be up and moving good. Fertile does attract bucks, so Tom determines to follow them deeper into the woods. But deer are skittish by nature and difficult to stalk. It's hard to sneak up on a damn deer in the snow. It really is. The snow kind of crunches, and them deer will hear that noise, and their first thing is to get the hell out of there. If this doe decides Tom is a threat, she'll alert the herd. The deer looked like they were gonna move. If that happens, I'm in trouble. All it takes is a mistake, and we don't get us some meat in the freezer. The patience of a hunter. It just takes time, you just gotta keep after it. Three hundred miles south in the Ruby Valley, Rich is testing his three most promising hounds to find the leader among them. He sets up a gauntlet of trials to evaluate their hunting and tracking skills. I'm gonna go through a few little trials with the dogs. I'm gonna set my roll cage up, and I got a piece of bear hide in there that'll look like an animal, put some scent on it. And then I'm gonna take Hatchet, Turbo, and Capone. I'm gonna come driving in, see if they pick up that scent on their own and open off of the truck, and I'll just turn them loose and just see what happens. 
Good boy, good boy, Capone. Good boy. Yeah. Good boy. Talk to him, man. Talk to him. Good job. When they get focused on that roll cage, then I'm going to back my truck up out of sight a little bit, because when I leave, I want them to stay there and stay focused. Focus is an essential skill for a lead dog who needs to keep a lion treed until Rich arrives. My main objective here is to teach him to stay at the tree, because it could be hours sometimes before I end up getting to the tree. You gotta watch him and see, you know, which one's gonna make a good lead dog. Talk to him, man, talk to him, good job. Rich then tries to distract the dogs. If any of them leave the tree, they probably aren't fit for the job. I'm gonna test them a little bit. Just walk back up there and see how focused and how they stay at the tree. Only one of the dogs ignores Rich and stays on the scent. The two-year-old pup, Hatchet. Good job, good job. Good boy, Hatchet, good boy, good boy. Turbo and Capone were starting to wander around and, uh, and you're teaching a dog to, you know, to stay at that tree. Hatchet is uh, sniffing and staying there. Good job! Hatchet's doing really good, you know. This is what he should do. He's by himself and he's focused on what he's supposed to be. He might be another brandy. Good boy! Though Hatchet looks like the front runner for the job, his real test is still ahead. There's a lot of potential in that dog right there to chase the lion down, but he's a young dog. I mean, you just never know. Four hundred miles south of the Arctic Circle, Alaska's Revelation Mountains are so difficult to reach that they're virtually uncharted territory. Few have ever attempted to survive in these remote snow-covered peaks. But Marty is facing down the danger in a risky move to jumpstart his flailing season. The signs so far are promising as he prepares to set his first trap. I can use this tree for my pole. I'll put in a pole set. You know, then Mark will crawl up the pole and steal the bait and usually just snap the trap. OK, so I'm wiring the trap. This is just a piece of moose hide. So that's the eye candy. That's what the Martin's going to go, hey, there's something up there. From here on out, I'm just going to move along on the edge of the timber here. And hopefully, I'll pick up more Martin sign. And if I see a Martin track, I'll make a set. So I'll just keep moving along here. Hopefully, see some more sign. Marty covers as much ground as he can, but blazing a trail on foot is no easy task. The whole idea behind the snowshoe line is getting the trail in so that you can walk fast and move along and cover some ground. Once I get this trail in and packed, then I got a good trail, and then I can extend it. And every day, I can extend it a little more up to a, you know as far as I want to go. My plan is to have loops running out, say, northeast, south, and west, and have those loops between 5 and 10 miles. So every day I can run this loop. This is just day one. I'm just scratching the surface here. It's all day long every day for quite a few days. Presto bango. 
you can't beat snowshoeing new country and making sets. Some days you work all day long hard and it's just all for naught. That's part of the game. Eighteen hundred miles away, Montana's Yak Valley is home to 8,000 white-tailed deer. State law protects the females and fawns in order to preserve the health of the growing population. But where there are females, there are sure to be males close behind. And after stalking two does for more than a mile, Tom spots an opportunity. These are buck tracks. You can see he's dragging his feet. going on down towards the river. Tracking is a really neat deal if a person really knows what they're doing. Tells you a whole bunch about the animals. I mean, every little track has its own little story. Tom's wooden bow has a limited range, so he has to get close to the buck without spooking it first. Finally, there was the buck. I've got to get within 20 yards with a bow in order to even take a shot. And you got to make a good one. Got that sucker. My arrow fired straight and true. And I hit him. Oh, sorry about that, old boy. And we've got meat in the frying pan. I want more, can I say? As dusk descends on Montana's Yak Valley, the temperature plunges to five below. Tom's recent kill should yield close to 100 pounds of meat. Now I've got to skin and process the meat. Oh, well, this is going to put some meat on the table for sure. But the bitter cold makes the job more difficult. Oh, geez, they're freezing up fast. I mean, the temperatures are getting real cold, and once it freezes, well, then you can't saw it or cut it or anything. So we got to get that done before it all freezes up. On here. Winter time just brings an extra hassle to it all. I'm always fighting that during this time of year. Hi. And there's only Nancy and I, so it isn't easy sometimes. Look at what we got. Wow, some nice meat. Tom and Nancy haul the carcass into the house where it's warm to finish breaking it down. It's a long, drawn out process, but at least we've got some meat in the freezer. We're gonna have a bunch of nice burger here and get some stew meat out of this one. Well, this was good, though. At least we got this deer in before it froze. Yeah, you did good. We needed this meat because this winter is a cold deal. But now we've got an extra 100 pounds of deer meat to eat. That's going to help get us through the winter anyhow. So we've been real lucky. Eighteen hundred miles northwest, the Revelation Mountains of western Alaska are buried in over fifty feet of snow a year. Marty navigates this tundra on snowshoes, and in his first day on his trapline, blazed just a single mile. But it's an early test of whether this location will produce. Today, I'm going to head out and uh, check my line for my tent camp. You know, your world shrinks a little bit. You don't have the opportunity to cover a lot of ground because it's all on foot. I'll just check traps along the way and hopefully pick up some fur.
Well, this one had the snow blown off it. Nothing. You know, it'd be nice to have Martin right off the bat, but just because I don't catch anything right away doesn't mean there aren't any. You know, it's only been a day or two. You know, sometimes you get off to a slow start and it picks up, and other times you catch a lot of fur early and then it peters out, so it, it varies. You could have a loop and not have any fur there. It doesn't mean there's nothing there. It means that maybe the animals are moving through the country and they haven't happened to pass through there at that time. That's what makes trapping trapping. If you knew exactly what was going to happen, it'd be boring. Oh, all right. Got a Martin. That is awesome. That's what it's all about right there. That's the prettiest picture there is. Yeah. Nice. All right. Things are looking up. One down. It's a pretty big gamble to just go through country you've never been before. It's nice to be able to come this far and then, you know, actually have it pay off. Twenty-eight hundred miles southeast, the Cimarron Valley is a rugged fifty-mile stretch of mesas and canyons, where hunter Kyle Bell has carved out a living for the last twenty years. He helps local ranchers with tough jobs in exchange for the right to hunt on their land. Today, he received a call that a fallen half-ton pine is blocking the only trail to a rancher's cattle pasture. Kyle has offered to remove it. This rancher is cut off from his cattle. He can't get in to check them. He can't get in to even take a look at the water situation. In just a day or two, it could become a life or death situation as far as the cattle are concerned. The quicker I can get that trail open, the better. into the trail. Golly. Man, what a mess. There ain't no way around this, that's for sure. This whole forest is dying from an infestation of pine beetles. Pine beetles are native to the area and usually attack only diseased or weakened trees. But drought conditions strip healthy trees of their defenses leaving forests vulnerable to the beetles, which have devoured more than 40 million acres over the last 15 years, an area roughly the size of Florida. Like the pine beetles got that one too. Damn bugs gonna kill every tree in the country. Pine beetles bore into trees and lay eggs. When the larvae hatch, they feast on the tree's moisture, leaving it dried up and dead. It's gonna have to come out in pieces. Worse than I thought it'd be. I ain't got any help, it's just me. And it's a pretty good sized tree. It's probably a 50 footer or better for blocking the trail. Better get busy. Kyle must delimb the massive tree before tackling the real problem the half ton trunk. Well, I finally got those logs down into position. I can drive up with my truck and hook a strap into those logs and then just back out with them. Got the tree out of the trail, but there's another one right here, right next to where the other one fell. Pine beetles got that, and next time the wind blows, probably gonna block the trail again. I just will go ahead and knock this thing down instead of waiting for it to happen. Kyle is an experienced tree feller, but the plague of beetles cause internal damage that make the tree unpredictable. Tree's dead. It's very unstable. 
I'm gonna have to pay attention how I cut it because there's a distinct possibility it's gonna snap. You just don't wanna be close to one when it happens. In New Mexico, Kyle has a dead half-ton pine in free fall. Oh, it didn't fall where I wanted it to, but it missed the truck. And it was that close. God, man, I'm glad to have that thing down. It's on the ground, it's safe, and that gives me the opportunity to put a little firewood in the back of my truck. <laughs> pine beetle larvae are still feeding on the wood. There's still a few of them in there. Meaning Kyle's job isn't over yet. Well, I'm pretty sure all the larvae was gone out of them trees. But sure enough, there's a big old fat juicy one. So that means there's still a live infestation in that particular tree. Probably still some in that stone. May have to take that out. what I thought. Dad gum. I wouldn't count on taking that stump out of there, but it is home to hundreds of them dad gum larvae. That is enough to quadruple the number of beetles that can go to the next trees. So my next plan of attack is not only to get the tree out, but the stump also. <clears throat> Gonna take more than an ax for this chore. Time to bring out the big gun. Ain't no tree stump gonna outdo me. I'm fixing to chain onto that sucker. Hell, that's a three-quarter ton pickup, four-wheel drive, two log chains against one stump. Time to put the pedal to the metal. Something's gonna give. that stump is wedged into that volcanic rock. It's not coming out of there without a fight. I've got to get enough of a running start that I can really put some pressure on that stump. Broke the dang hook off. Seven hundred miles away. Montana's Tobacco Root Mountains are a 25-mile stretch of the mighty northern Rockies. But the region is also mountain lion country, home to as many as 50 cats that hunt its peaks. Rich is on his way deeper into the mountains in search of lion tracks. If his youngest hound, Hatchet, can catch the scent and track a real lion... Come on, Hatchet. Use your nose, little boy. ...he might have what it takes to become a lead dog. We got the real deal going here. Now they're running a lion, so they have to be careful. Good boy, Hatchet. Good boy. What is it, man? What is it? Good boy. There's a lion track right here. golden opportunity. It snowed a little bit last night, and this lion track is early this morning. Hatchet takes the lead. This is a sink or swim test. Once he tracks down the lion, any mistake could be his last. When I turn my dogs loose, you never know what's gonna happen. Turbo and Capone back him up. They move fast because the scent trail is fresh. They're on him. Rich can read the hunt by interpreting the dog's barks and howls. When they're out chasing a lion, I know which dog's in front and what the dogs are doing, because none of their voices are the same. Turbo's there, but I don't know what he's... That was the poem. They're moving. Turbo has a chop. 
Capone has a big old ball and hatchet chops and he balls a little bit. Oh yeah, they're trees. Rich hurries to catch up to the pack. These three dogs have all treed lions before, but never without a more experienced dog in the lead. I gotta stay with them. They're all young dogs, and so, you know, I mean, they're gonna make mistakes. There's dog tracks. There's a lion track right here. A lion ran through here. He's been running and jumping. He's gonna jump, he's gonna jump. New Mexico's Cimarron Valley is a wind-scoured landscape of crags and canyons. Any vegetation that survives is built to withstand frigid gusts that whip across the open fields at 40 miles an hour. Kyle is working to rip a stump from the rugged turf, but it's putting up a fight. Ah, man. Broke my dang hook off. You know, when chains start flying, it's a serious thing. People get hurt. Son of a gun. If it hit a feller in the back of the head or anywhere else, if it didn't kill you, it dang sure hurt you bad. The only choice I have now is to try them rocks out of the way and try to chop some of them roots out of there to loosen that stump up a little bit. Kyle must pull the stump now before the beetle larvae can spread to nearby trees. Some of the roots have grown under rock. Some of them have grown over rock. Some of them have grown in between the rock. There's a lot more under the ground than there is on top of the ground. Well, that's pretty good. I can get down there to them roots now. There's so many rocks, I'm really afraid to try to stick my chainsaw in there. So I'm gonna try to weaken those roots just with my axe. got enough of them roots turned loose now to ride again with the chain. I really don't want to snap that chain again. But I ain't quitting till that stump comes out of the ground. I might put a jerk on that sucker and get it out of there. It's about damn time. Woohoo! Man, after all the effort I put into getting that stump out of the ground, ain't no way I'm leaving it here. I'm sure that there's more larvae in that stump. Best way for me to make sure that my job is complete is for me to cut it in firewood just like I did the rest of that tree. I <sighs> made a pretty good pile of wood. Trouble, Eric. I got the trail open so the rancher can check his cattle. I got me a load of firewood. Took a lot more work than I thought it would, but I got it done. It's just another day in the life of the mountain man. Seven hundred miles northwest. In the Ruby Valley, Rich's dogs have treed a mountain lion, and first-time lead dog Hatchet is running point. I don't know if they can hold them in that tree or not until they get over there. Rich has to hurry. Each passing moment gives his dogs another chance to make a deadly mistake, but the snow makes the steep terrain slick and dangerous. I gotta get over this ridge here because my dogs are gonna end up grabbing them and then there's a fight. This lion's getting pissed and she's liable to kill one of these dogs. It's gonna jump, quick, quick.
Get over here, get over here. Yo. Dogs are on him. We had the lion treat, we got in here, but it jumped over him, and now they lost her. The cat has the advantage in this country, you know, I mean, it's just straight up and down and rocky and cliffy, and the dogs can't move as fast as the cat. Hey, where is it? You guys missed it. It was a good race. They did OK. I mean, they could have stayed at the tree a little bit better. Capone, here! They weren't totally focused. And that's the trouble when you run three males together. They're always trying to outdo each other. The cat has Rich's dogs running in circles, so he pulls them off the hunt. Come on, you guys tired? Good job. Come on, you guys. Let's go. I'm real happy with my dogs, and they're doing a real good job without Brandy. I don't expect my dogs to fill the shoes of Brandy overnight. Turbo, love it. The more experience I give them, the better they're going to be. Brandy took a few years to get where she's at, but this is a start. Rich now prepares to groom his youngest dog to be leader of the pack. Hatchet seems to fill those parts that I really like. I think he's going to be an excellent dog. But he's a young dog. I mean, he's just, you know, I'm just starting out the training. But it was a good day. I and mean, I got to see a mountain lion. And it got to live, and I got to have fun. So I mean, we're all happy. Previously on Mountain Men, Morgan makes a narrow escape from the dead zone of the Alaska Range. There's no room to make mistakes out here. I'm in full-on survival mode. It's kind of a all-or-nothing kind of deal. In the Revelation Mountains, Marty sets his sights on an elusive prize. If there's lynx tracks, so it's a really good sign there might be a lynx around. You never know. Hopefully I have a cat when I come back. That's what makes trapping neat. You never know. And in Montana, Tom goes on the chase to stay in the game. I need a good, clean kill shot. Come on. Stand up. Stand up. All right. thousand feet up in Montana's Bridger Mountains. After stalking a herd of elk for five miles on foot, Tom's last ditch effort for winter meat comes down to one shot. He's down there. Well, that was, that was an ordeal. That we did it. With this elk, it's like money in the bank. You can't ask for any better than that. Oh, buddy. It will take several hours for Tom to break down the carcass, but he'll need to work quickly if he's to finish before it freezes. Meat's not meat till it's in the pan. First thing you do is scut the animal. The main thing is get the intestines out of them. As soon as the animal dies, the intestines, they start gassing up. And if you leave them for a long time, they'll actually bloat and it'll, it'll actually ruin the meat. There's a, a layer of skin that separates the intestines from the lungs and the heart and the liver. Where the bullet went? That all has to be cut out of there. All the innards all, all emptied out. 
The elk provides up to 200 pounds of meat, and Tom will put almost every other part of the carcass to use, including the hide and teeth. We try not to waste anything, but we try to use up all of what we collect off the woods. An elk hide should be worth maybe $800 if it comes out really nice. I'm gonna pop these two ivories up. Elk ivories used to be fangs that stuck down out of the primitive elk's mouth, like canine teeth, and that's what's left of them. These are really kind of an ivory, like an elephant tusk. Two elk ivories alone will fetch up to $300. It's a good feeling to, to be able to harvest something and use it all. Ooh, now, ooh, now. It's like getting paid at the end of a long work year or something. Ooh, ooh, now. If all these things come together, this has been a real hot now. But it feels really good right now. <laughs> it feels good. Far north, in the Alaska range, Morgan's recovered from a brush with death. Two days ago, his overnight trek across the mountains led him straight into a blinding whiteout on the edge of an avalanche zone. Can't hardly see where I'm going. You guys, you shouldn't be bunched up here with me. If something cuts loose, three of us don't need to get buried. Now, with the mountains finally at his back and more than 200 miles of Alaskan tundra behind him, Morgan is ready to make a final push towards his homestead. The land I've got is probably about 70 miles if the crow flies that way. But he's not out of the woods yet. The body's demanding a lot of protein right now, all the exercise I've been getting the last few weeks. It's really nice to get out of the mountains and back into some thick forest but I got three or four days worth of food left, and I got about a week's worth of travel. I'm definitely on the lookout for any kind of way to stretch my food supply at this point. I packed about as much food as I could. It's an inexact science planning for this kind of stuff. You don't really know how fast, how many miles you're gonna make in a day. You know, I've got firearm, I've got ways to harvest food. Right now, I'd love to find a little critter of some kind to roast for dinner. A nice, juicy porcupine, like a grouse or a ptarmigan, rabbit. Those are pretty much my options. So far, I haven't seen much of anything. You know, I'm always looking for sign. Small game animals often congregate around water sources, and Morgan's counting on a nearby stream to lead him to his next meal. This creek here is going my direction. I'm going to hop on it, walk on the ice. It's like a beaver's been at work in here. There. It's this season's for sure. There's definitely a beaver around here. Beavers are pretty heavy. I think the record beaver is over 100 pounds, and I think 40, 50 pounds is pretty average for him. So you probably get a good 20, 30 pounds of meat out of that. And that would be just about the right amount of food for me. And a nice beaver pelt would be pretty awesome. Let's see if there's any more sign up ahead. There's a whole bunch more chewed off sticks. There's a slide over there and another one right here. So that beaver is coming out of the water onto the snow. I think I'm gonna sneak up onto the bank here and, uh, and just wait and see if he comes out to do his thing. You know, let's see if he shows himself. I've never hunted a beaver before. It seems like a long shot. I may just be wasting time, but 
I need to find more food, otherwise I'm gonna be on really slim rations. And I'd rather not hike hungry. In Alaska's Revelation Mountains, the rules of the wild are changing. And Marty Majorato has spent the last eight weeks working to stay ahead of the curve. After not being able to be on the trap line trapping, it's nice to be out and actually run in line. Running traps, catching fur, that's what it's all about. Even the smallest change in nature's balance affects Marty's livelihood on the line. And while an unusually warm weather system delayed the start of his season, it also created an unexpected opportunity. I was very surprised to see lynx tracks this high up because they hunt rabbits, and rabbits are usually in the lowland. But this year, for some reason, there's rabbits here. So I imagine that's why they're here. Lynx are solitary and elusive animals, making them among the most difficult to snare. Their fur fetches a premium price on the market. So Marty set five traps to increase his odds. It'd be really cool to actually catch a lynx in one of those sets I made. All right, this is my first cat set. Hey, the trap and drag are missing. Something happened. The drag's missing. The way I got my cubby set set up is I put them on a drag so that they don't tear up the cubby when they're caught there. So they get caught and then they take off with this drag and the drag will tangle on the first little bit of brush or a tree or something that they come to. They usually don't go far at all. Looks like he went through that way. It looks like a nice big one, too. He just got caught. Looking for a good shot. Come on, turn your head. A lynx is a specialized predator. They're gonna get nasty if you try killing them. Even once you catch them, they're hard to hold because they are so powerful, so nasty. If he jumps and that line breaks, it's going to be bad. In the Revelation Mountains, Marty has a 50-pound lynx in his sights. If you get up close, they can get kind of wicked on you. Lynx are very aggressive. So I need to stay back a little bit, or it's probably going to bite me. All right. Looks like a nice big tom. Lynx fur is what they call a luxury fur, and it's used a lot in the trim trade. Where a uh, utility fur is more like a muskrat or raccoon, where it keeps you warm, but. Lynx fur has the added aspect of being real pretty. Cool. Put him away. Go remake the set and go check some more traps. I'm really happy that fur is starting to come in, and then with the added bonus of the lynx, it makes it all worth it. Pretty neat to be catching cats in this country.
in the foothills of the Great Alaska Range. Morgan stakes out a beaver den in hopes of adding some meat to his dwindling food supply. But after two hours of waiting in the freezing cold, he's seen no sign of his prey. I've been here a while waiting to see if I can see a beaver, but taking the time to try to stake this beaver out is another cost benefit thing, whether I'm going to waste time sitting there, end up with nothing, or in a couple hours I could make three or four miles. And I'm getting chilly. Damn it. Wondering more if I just bag this and keep moving. Okay, this is a waste of time. Thinking I'm done here. I'm like, the beaver's not coming out. I'm too damn cold sitting here. Uh, I'm starting to shiver. I need to get moving. Get back down on the ice for the walking's a little easier. Oh, here he is. Damn. He went under the ice. Damn it, I know I hit him. Look at all his blood. Oh. Oh. Ah. Ah, he's gone. Damn it. I thought, there he goes. I just killed this animal, and now I can't recover it. And I'm not going to have any food. He got flushed downstream in the current. Ah, damn. Crap. Maybe he got. Oh, here he is, here he is, here he is. See him there, that dark spot? He's caught up on something. He's not moving, I think he's hung up on something. There's a bit of current under there, though. I gotta get him out of there before he gets flushed away. Beneath the ice, the water temperature is a bone-chilling 20 degrees. Uh, come here, you little bugger. No, no, no. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> He's a nice one. They just love to run for the water. They're like a mountain goat running off a cliff. His last throws of life, he just wanted to get back to where he felt secure. That's a bunch of food. That's a few days worth of, I mean, that's just, that's gonna at least double the food that I've got now. I'm gonna find a place to bed down and get camping and get some beaver meat roasting on the fire get a little warmed up, too. Happy day. Across the country, in North Carolina, winter rain has soaked the Blue Ridge Mountains for three days straight, bringing Eustace Conway's logging operation to a standstill. That looks good, doesn't it? Creek water corn cakes. Oh, heck yeah. But a break in the weather means it's time to get back to work. What do you think, Eustace? We're going to get up on that steep ground today with it frozen? Yeah, I wish it was a little drier, but we'll make it do. Up on the high ground, we've got some trees we haven't been able to get to yet, but we're going to try to get up there. All we can do is try, and we'll find out, you know? Tom, you up for that hill today? You guys have been talking about it all week. Yeah. I'm a little nervous, but if you guys think it's all right, I'm with you. Their target today is a single giant poplar tree that the landowner marked for removal. To reach it, they'll need to climb 200 yards up a steep ridge, a sharp 45 degree incline blanketed with slick leaves and rocks. Let's see if we can get everything together. We'll head on out. I guarantee you that this is gonna be a lot harder job than what we've been up against so far. You know, that steep stuff's just dangerous, it's hard, and uh, we, we've got our work cut out for us today. Let's see if we can just tie up right here. 
see it's up there. See that big one there? Yeah. That one at the ribbon, that's the one we're headed for way up on that hillside. This is some steep, dangerous stuff right here. Frozen underneath and wet and mushy on top. Oh, you all right? Man, this thing is slick. Well, I can hardly stand up. Yeah. I'm not sure we ought to be up on this today. It's a long way to the horses. Well, we made it. <laughs> Man, I don't want to come and go up through that hill too many times today. <laughs> no, let's, let's get everything down that we need down. Now if we can just get this guy down the hill. The poplar is mostly rotted, but if Eustace can get it back to camp, he can salvage the usable timber at a pure profit. We're probably going to get one or two logs, 80 to $180 out of this one right here. I think I can hopefully steer a little bit towards the horses there. Then they can pull it down on the bottom. So I'm going to try to steer it with a hinge cut and let the hinge pull it over here. Hopefully it won't get too close to them and spook them. Eustace has one shot to drop the tree within a narrow 20-foot corridor. Then he's banking on the steep slope to usher it to the bottom. The hinge that you leave on the tree, that's the part that you don't cut through. That's what it folds and hinges on. That's what it controls which way it pulls. in North Carolina. Woo! Man, did you see that? It hit hard, didn't it? There's a lot of things that can go wrong uh, when you're felling a large tree, and it happens so fast that you hardly even have time to blink. The tree landed in the clear, but it's still 30 feet from the road. We're going to need to get that log somehow over towards that path the horses are on. Yep. Yeah, let's go on down there. So the next step is to saw it to length, working them down where we can get to them to pull them with the horses. Man, that thing made a big hole when it came down. Let's we'll see what we got in this thing for a log. Yeah. Once it's all cut into pieces, we're going to roll them as far as we can by hand. I don't know if we're going to be able to roll them or not. We're just going to try. Yeah, I think this piece right here is going to be the most valuable piece. We'll get a 10-foot section right down there to Tom. I'll tell you what, I'll saw here some. If you'll saw down there some, we'll see if we can free it up. Eustace needs to salvage at least one straight 10-foot log in order to make any money off this otherwise rotten tree. This one should be free. I gotta be loose down there. So what we're gonna do is try to roll it that way. We're gonna roll this? Well, we're gonna try. <laughs> okay, my man. I am a little nervous because that's a big tree. Somebody could get hurt real easy if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. <sighs> All right. One, two, three. There we go. One, two, three. One, two, three. <gasps> There we go. Oh, oh. There you go. Oh, oh. Ah. <sighs> God. That was too close. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, Tom just doesn't have enough experience on these steep hillsides. He might have learned some logging and stuff somewhere else, but. He's just not really aware of everything that can go wrong. We're just worried about you going down there with that log. You gotta let the log do its own thing. Amazing how far that thing went down the hill, isn't it? It went down so far that we might have to pull it back up just a little bit. We don't want to pull anything back up.
in Alaska. Morgan prepares for a hard-earned meal. Got a nice bed of coals there. First thing I want to do is get my knife nice and sharp before I go to skin it, you know, using, using the knife around camp, whatever, you always get it dull. I'm feeling really blessed that I recovered this beaver, and it's going to be awesome to have plenty of fresh meat. I'm going to cook the carcass probably and strip all the little bits of meat off that, and then the quarters, I'm going to save them to cook them fresh over a couple of days so I can have fresh meat for a couple of nights. I'm going to try to keep as much fat as I can off the hide so I don't have to pack it around and flesh it later. Oh, here it is, skinned off. It's pretty nice skin. It's gonna make a really nice hat or something. Gonna be some fleshing to do on that one. I've got another three or four or five days worth of food, probably 10 pounds of good meat I'll get off this animal, besides the nice fur. And I'm stoked, you know, it's my first beaver. We've got meat, not only just meat, but it's nice greasy meat, so it's got some fat to it. And I've got a cool pelt, so I'm sitting pretty now. It's not too strong. Sometimes I think beaver gets pretty fishy. Not bad. Oh yeah, it's a nice fatty piece too. Can't even begin to describe to you how good fat tastes after you've been out here and you're hungry. You know, as long as it's cooked through, not into raw fat, but uh, fat's got nine calories per gram. So it's your densest energy source. It's gonna keep you twice as warm as just straight protein or straight carbohydrates, sugars. You know, it's got twice as much energy in it. I probably got 60 miles between me and my land right now. And unless something really derails my progress, I got plenty of food now. I'm gonna eat some more of this and uh, stretch my bag out. Hopefully just get some good rest and, and hit it golf tomorrow and be one day closer. miles south of the Arctic Circle in Alaska's Revelation Mountains. Marty rolls into camp with his biggest haul of the season, a lynx pelt worth $400. This day turned out better than I had hoped it would. It's exciting to catch lynx. This makes it worthwhile. It's been a really good day. It's 20 below zero, and the freeze will set in within an hour. I like to get the lynx skinned because I don't want to have to take them home frozen. It's just extra hauling weight. And lynx aren't bad to eat. Skinning a lynx is pretty much just like a martin. You just make a couple of initial cuts and then just peel it off. But in some places you have to actually use a knife if you can pull it. It goes faster. Lynx are pretty thin. I always like catching lynx. It's a good sign, you know, that it's a good trapping country. When I look at the revelations, it's totally new country and it's unknown. It's always a gamble, but after a day like today, it makes me feel even better about investing so much time and energy into this area. It helps make it worth it to me to bring my family out here. Don, I'm looking forward to that. You can see the hides already froze. I finally feel like I'm a trapper, like uh, this is what I'm meant to do. I'm looking forward to doing some more trapping tomorrow. In Montana's Ruby Valley, predators are proving to be a growing threat this winter. Mountain lions and a recent explosion of the wolf population in the area are keeping Rich Lewis and his dogs busy. 
To keep up with the pace, the hunting team must be in peak condition. And today, Rich is testing their stamina in a 10-mile run. Come on, get in. It's like shooting a rifle. You just don't grab your gun and go hunting. You need to sight it in and be ready. When I put them on a lion track, my dogs have to be in good condition because if they get tired, the lion's going to get away from us. Mountain lions are so powerful, they can run indefinitely at a speed of 10 miles an hour. So Rich will condition his dogs to run twice as fast. Well, I'm gonna let the dogs out and rode them down this road, give them some exercise. I need to make sure they can run a long distance. So eight to 10 miles is what I'm looking for. Then I know they're in good shape and I have a good chance of keeping up with the lion. All right, one at a time, let's go, one at a time. Come on, easy, easy, come on, come on, come on. Come on, Diamond, good girl, come on, girl. The youngest in the pack is one-year-old Diamond. I think they're ready to rock and roll. Rich is watching her closely to see if she's that rare breed, a born lion hunter. Let's go! Come on, let's go, hurry up, come on. Good dogs. Dogs need to go on a long run, just like an athlete. They have to stay in shape. They really have to put pressure on a lion to get him to go up the tree. If them dogs can catch him, he goes up the tree right away. Well, my speedometer looks like I'm about seven miles so far, so another couple, two, three miles. They're all doing pretty good. Turbo's slacking off a little bit, but he's starting to get a little older. He's a little too heavy yet. Got to get him on a diet, I guess. Come on, Turbo, let's go, get up here. Come on, Six-year-old Turbo is normally one of Rich's fastest dogs, and one he relies on for even the most challenging hunts. Turbo's kinda falling behind the rest of them. Young Diamond hugs the outside of the pack, matching the veteran dog's stride for stride. Diamond's doing good, this is, she's just a year old. Well, I better get these guys loaded up. Come on, hey! Woo! Hey, come on! Turbo, come on! Come on, Diamond! Come on, load up! Come on, Diamond! Good girl! Come on, load up! Good girl! Diamond has energy to spare, but after passing the speed and stamina test, she will now have to rise to the challenge of a much harder trial. The dogs did real good. Now I just have to let them out on the scent and see what they're going to do. In Montana's Ruby Valley, Rich Lewis is working his hunting dogs to keep them in peak performance for chasing mountain lions. After a 10-mile endurance run, the next challenge is critical to refining their most powerful skill. When I train my dogs, they have to be physically in shape to run a long distance, but I also have to train them to develop their nose. The better they develop their nose, the better they can smell the track. I'm gonna go to another location now that I can lay some scent and work with them on good scent and bad scent. This looks like a good spot right here. The hounds have 100 times the smelling power of a human, but they perceive every scent as equally strong. The most difficult training exercise will hone their ability to distinguish one scent from the other. These are deer glands. I cut these off a of deer when I kill a deer and salt them. Deer glands hold a lot of scent. I'll wet these, and this is what I'm gonna drag through. The snow is one of my scents. This is a piece of old bear hide. I'll wet this, put my lion urine on there, and make a drag, and then I'll get somewhere where I can put it in the roll cage so the dogs think that they've got that scent of a lion and they should go to tree and, and then these other scents, I'm hoping they don't follow them, but we're gonna find out. I'm constantly training them because the more I train them, the better their nose is, and that's what I gotta develop. 
And if they develop a really good nose, they have a lot better chance of catching a lion. I'm just leaving the gland here for that smell. And then I'm gonna take my lion drag and go way out here. There's a lot of work that's involved. You just don't take a dog and go out lion hunting. They cannot chase deer and elk because a lion, and I've seen it, will see deer and they will go right through a herd of deer because they know there's a good chance that them dogs are gonna chase that deer instead of him. Rich drags four different scents over a 10-acre area, including a stream where inexperienced dogs tend to lose the track. Now I just have to let them out on the scent and see what they do. In North Carolina, Eustace and his team have spent most of the day wrestling a 500-pound log off a steep mountain slope. But now they've overshot the trail below. Until they're able to hook it to the horses and haul it back to camp, there will be no payday. Because it's too hard for the horses to pull just straight up that slippery hill. We're going to rig a little system with a rope and some pulleys and anchor them on some trees. Hopefully that log will just go right up that slick hillside. So if we can take the end of this with some grabs and sort of pull it up the hill, uh -huh. we're going to take the rope around the pulley on that poplar, and then back down the hill to that tree there, put another pulley on that poplar, and then shoot the rope down to where the horses are right now. The horses can go down the hill using all their body weight and gravity on them, and that hopefully will pull that log up the hill. You drop one pulley right about there if you wanted to. Bye. Bye. Good boys. Go ahead. Good job, Preston. I believe we're about ready for the horses. Anytime you start moving these big things around, it's dangerous on a good day when the ground is not slicker than snot. The horses are hitched to the pulley in order to make the difficult maneuver. Bye. Bye. You don't want to roll it somewhere by mistake or get it lodged where it's harder to get out. So when you make a move, you want it to count. Three, bye, bye. Y'all get out of the way. All right, ready? And come on, boys. Rest easy, boys. We made it, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, that worked real good. It cost Eustace an entire day to fell this single tree. And at best, he only earned $180 worth of timber for his efforts. Today has been a challenging day, and Tom made some mistakes, and that set us back, and we didn't get as much done as I wanted to, but we at least made it safely through the day. And come up, boys. Came in with one log. That's better than nothing. In the Ruby Valley, Rich is testing his dog's tracking skills to keep them sharp during mountain lion season. I laid out a couple of different scents for my dog. I only want them to follow one of them. Now it's time to let them go and see what they're gonna do. Turbo ranks as one of Rich's top dogs, but he lagged behind the pack on the 10-mile run. Rookie dog Diamond breezed through the run, but young dogs lack focus and are easily distracted. I let one dog go at a time. When you're running a lion, you don't let them all go. You let one dog go to line it out. I try to have an older dog with the younger dog. They respect the older dog and kind of follow him and do what he does. Once I let him go, I'm going to be observing how the dog handles himself. 
not moving too fast, picking up the scent, and make sure that he stays on that lion track. It's kind of up to them, but I want them to pick up on the scent that I trained them to do. Turbo just picked up the track. Turbo's on that drag right now. He's doing a real nice job. He's looking for that track slow. He's what you call cold trailing. He's not moving real fast because there isn't a lot of scent, but he's smelling it. He's picking up enough to keep it. While Turbo methodically follows the lion scent, Diamond falters. She's running around with her head cut off. She doesn't know anything. She is smelling, though. That's a good sign. She's using her nose. Turbo does a really good job when the track gets difficult to smell and slows down. I'm trying to teach Diamond that. She's a young dog and really hyper and wound up right now, so if he kind of hangs back and moves slower, she's going to kind of run around, but then she'll kind of come back to him and see what he's doing. See what she does. She's smelling it. She's not sure of herself. Turbo arrives at the cage that's spiked with lion scent, trailed closely by Diamond. While failing to follow her lead dog, Diamond stayed on the scent until she reached the goal. Good boy, Turbo! That a girl, Diamond! I didn't walk right into the roll cage because I wanted to stand back and listen to the sound of their bark, because every dog has a different voice. So I can tell the difference when they're out and I can't see them, I listen for their voice, and that's what I was doing, trying to learn Diamond's voice compared to Turbo's. Turbo sails through the smell test to prove he's still one of Rich's top dogs. And after a rough start, Diamond shows an inborn ability to detect and follow the right scent. With more training, she may yet become a lion hunter. They're doing good. Mainly, I want that pup to get used to the scent. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. I'm real confident these dogs are ready for a lion. I'm kind of falling towards Turbo as my lead dog. Diamond was running around a little bit, but actually smelt it and ran over to it, and she started baying it up. I was real happy with what she'd done. I think they're on the right track. forming right over me. Damn it. It's like I'm going to be here a little while. So let's see if we can fire up that saw. How's that look? Oh, what in the world? You're basically creating micro explosions. So it's got the potential to go real bad real quick. That thing can blow. Right. Montana's trapping season is down to its final days. And in the Yak Valley, Tom Orr's determined to eke out every last fur. Sean's running the majority of the traps that we've got out right now. And I'm trying to find a few places where we can still pick up a few furs before the season ends. All right. At 75, Tom's nearly retired from trap line duties. But today, he's back in action for a final push. Our catch this year hasn't been as good as what it was last year, so we're trying to make up for it right now. Looking for a sure thing, Tom's targeting an old honey hole deep in the wilderness. This is our last big shot where we can still bring some more furs to the table and end up with another successful season. To get there, he's facing a two-mile trek through the bush that would be grueling for even a much younger man. This land that I'm trapping today, I haven't trapped it for years and years, but the problem is it's, it's a long canoe drag to get back into it. You gotta pull the canoe over the logs and there's limbs sticking out. But Tom isn't the type to shrink from a challenge. Uh, 
it's just it's just hard work getting in here. And there's lots of easier places to get to than here, but the more remote, the better. If we want to be lucky and catch something. Central Alaska. How you doing, girl? Good little plane here. Homesteader Morgan Beasley is finally prepared for takeoff. All right. It's been a week since he arrived in Talkeetna to retrieve his new wings. It's pretty good. Where mechanical problems and weather kept him grounded. Just gotta make sure I got everything. Until today. I've been, uh, you know, waiting for weeks now to get this plane out to the homestead mechanically everything's working right and I've got pretty clear skies I'm just pretty excited to get out there an early spring blew in to melt the last of the snow in town but he's facing a 150 mile journey home and there's no telling what conditions he'll find once he's airborne so the first 60 miles it's just over thick forest and some um, swamps and stuff but then it goes up to the Alaska range the Great Alaska Range is the third highest in the world and contains the tallest peak in North America, Denali, an elevation of 20,000 feet. This is a pretty intimidating thing to fly across these mountains. We've got 70, 80 miles of solid mountains um, between us and the other side of the world. It's not just one or two ridges, it's like seven or eight. Flying across these peaks is daunting for any pilot. But for a rookie like Morgan, there's an added risk. There's some good emergency landing sites, but a lot of it's pretty snow covered and, and would be a pretty rough, you know, it'd be a crash landing probably if I have to go down. In the bush, preparation can mean the difference between life and death. Morgan's mission today is to set up an emergency supply of fuel hidden midway between Talkeetna and his homestead. The idea with the fuel cache is that if you know I have to fly into a bunch of storms or something and I have to like retreat out of the mountains, I might be a little low on fuel to get all the way back to a town or a village. I'll load this thing up and do my pre-flight here. Checking the flaps, checking the propeller for any nicks. Are the wings solid? Basically check every moving part that might have a impact on the airplane. I'm gonna double check the pressure here. That one is a little low. These tires are set to run between uh, six and 12 pounds per square inch. So I'm just gonna pump it up one PSI, make sure I'm well within the limits. And uh, everything else looks good to go, ready for flight. So I think I'm gonna climb in and head out. Okay, excited to do this. There's a lot of unknowns, so. Fingers crossed, weather's good, and uh, make it into this fuel cache and then uh, into the homestead today. Deep in North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountain wilderness. I'll just kind of lay it out here on the ground. Eustace Conway's hatching a plan to reclaim a lost opportunity. Yeah, last year was a great success with the furniture business, so I'm thinking I can make a lot of nice furniture out of a big pine tree. So I can turn that into many thousands of dollars. Last week, he and Joseph Roberts got an antique bandsaw up and running for the first time in decades. This bandsaw has just really opened up a whole world of possibilities on this furniture making business. The machine is the key to producing high-end homemade furniture, like the custom farm table he and Preston sold for top dollar last year. Something like this could easily sell for 3,500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Wow. With handcrafted items in high demand, 
an expert craftsman like Eustace can make a small fortune from just a few pieces of lumber and some elbow grease. I mean, that's just solid. Yeah, simple but functional and good lines. And today's task is to test a potential new product, an early American-style bed frame. Making these beds, I think, is really going to be key. I'm hoping we can get a premium dollar for these so we can go make that down payment. Eustace has been working all winter to raise money for a down payment on neighboring land that's recently gone up for sale. I've spent my whole life trying to keep this place wild. If somebody puts a development right beside me here, that could really mess us up. So far, he's raised $25,000 towards a bid on the property, but it may not be enough. Does that line up pretty good? It's pretty close to me. Now, to bring in the most money possible, he's prototyping a bed frame using the ancient technique of mortise and tenon. Oh, that looks good. A method of construction that uses the wood itself, not glue or nails, to hold the frame together. Well, let's see if we can fire up that saw and, and saw one, and if that all goes good, we'll come saw these other three. All right, sounds good. Fire it up, Joseph. The solid wood is trimmed down to create a peg known as a tenon. First tenon. Yeah, that looks pretty good. If, if you can handle cutting these, you cut some more tenons, I'll start laying off the mortise holes. All right, sounds good. Mortise holes bored into the adjoining piece of wood form a joint to hold the tenons in place. I'll just drill a hole and then use a chisel to cut it out square so it exactly matches. And that's where we get a lot of this strength is because the contact surface is big. Well, this one looks good. Doing a good job. For the decorative centerpiece of the headboard, they cut an interlocking dovetail joint. A dovetail is kind of like a tenon joint that's made like a triangle so that it can't pull back out. It's just a, a joint that holds itself together, and that's the beauty of it. What in the world? In the Blue Ridge Mountains. Oh, the belt broke. Eustace's recently restored century-old bandsaw is on the fritz. You just ripped that off. I'm glad it wasn't the blade that came no, flying yeah. off. One of us be missing a finger. The problem is a tear in the 10-foot belt. Who knows where the pin went? The belt has uh, connectors, and they're kind of like interwoven fingers. And then there's a pin that slides through. You can't really just run out to your local hardware store and buy another flat belt. They're kind of antiquated. And so I'm going to go try to find something that we can fix it with. Ah, uh, some fence wire. Oh, yeah. That'll do it, I think. That'll work good. But this belt is crucial. So I'm depending on this bandsaw to finish the rest of the bed. Keep it lined up. Really pay attention to that side. There it went. There we go. I wouldn't call it good as new, but I'd say it'll sure do. I think it's going to work. Well, there's one way to find out how good our fix is. Yep. Well, right now, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed, but I think it's going to work. There we go. All right, let's we'll see what it does. OK. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! Yo! Now that we've got the bandsaw back up and running, uh, we can finish our last few little cuts, and uh, and we'll be ready to start assembling this bed. We've measured and cut and done all our mortise and tenon joints right and everything, it'll just kind of go together like a set of Lincoln logs. No nails, no screws. Yep. It's pretty neat. Well, that looks good there, Joseph. Let's stand it up and check see. it out. One, two, three. The closer this thing's to getting to finish, it starts to take shape, and Joseph and I are just really getting excited about seeing it come to life. Well, what do you think? <laughs> I think that's a bad. <laughs> that's pretty cool.
A mixture of beeswax and linseed oil seals and protects the raw wood. Man, I like this. Look at that. This bed is a good example of the way mountain people in this area have been living forever, you know? Like, make something beautiful with what's around you, and uh, so I think that's a pretty prime example of that. Hopefully a buyer is gonna think that as well. But the only way to find out if the bed will sell is to head to town. I'm really hoping this bed will sell and get us some cash in our hands so we can go make that down payment. Alaska's Kodiak Coast. Come on, baby. One of my pontoons might be taking water. Bear hunter Mike Horstman's supply run is cut short, inches from shore. <sighs> but with the tide coming in, there's nothing he can do until morning. The barge is not floating 100 percent. I'm just going to leave it for the evening. And in the morning at low tide, I'll see what I have here. I'm basically at the mercy of uh, the tides. I'm going to take a look at all my floats here and check all the chambers and see if there's any water in it. And the only way to get it out is through the inspection holes in the top with a siphon. That's definitely salt water. I'll let this drain out. That's, it's hard to say how much is in there. Now, hopefully, we don't have any water in this one. No. This barge is getting kind of old. This here is looking like it didn't hold. The pontoon has an old hairline fracture that Mike's trying to patch with waterproof epoxy, but it's no match for the corrosive salt water of Passag Shack Bay. It's weeping a little bit. That's definitely taking water there. Get this old stuff out of here. I'm gonna repair it again. Because it's on the, the seam where these two pieces were welded, that's why it didn't hold. A new layer of sealant is a temporary fix that should hold long enough to get him home. All right, I got that repair done. The only other thing, this here, I'm not sure if that dent has anything to do with it or not, but it looks like it could with this thing just rolling on the beach here in the surge last night. It could have uh, stressed this weld, just kind of blended into the edges. And make it look like art. This stuff is, it's got a real quick dry time, and so there'll be no problem with this curing up in time, and hopefully that'll take care of my problems. All right. But the fix can't be tested until the barge floats at the next high tide, three hours from now. Hopefully this is gonna float. Six hundred feet above the Alaskan wilderness. It's a long, slow grind across the flats here. Morgan's closing in on the treacherous peaks of the Great Alaska Range. Definitely been a little more cloud buildup as I move towards the mountains here. And the final safe haven before the mountain crossing. I'm getting close to my uh, fuel drop location. This is the last gravel runway on the route between his homestead and the nearest town. The ideal location to hide an emergency stash of fuel. Gonna lose some altitude here. Oh. I got my storage jugs here, they're just normal gas cans. I'm gonna fill them uh, all the way up and save my fuel bladders for flying. Okay, good to the last drop here. This stuff is precious. 
The 10 gallons of fuel are enough for an extra 50 miles of flight time that could be a critical survival buffer if the unexpected strikes. I'm gonna cover them with this uh, trash bag and tuck it under the cans here. That way, you know, if it rains a lot, water won't seep into the cans or on the lid. Pretty soon the brush will be leafed out. You won't be able to see back in here at all. But this fuel clash could really save me a lot of trouble. Okay, gonna have to remember this spot. The fuel will keep for up to a year, making this a critical lifeline for the new pilots. Better get Margaret on the radio and see what the weather's doing back at home as long as I'm here on the ground. Our place is right on the edge of the mountain range on the other side. And it's really common that you know, it's doing one thing on one side of the range and something completely different on the other. Hello? Hey. It, we're getting a little bit of rain here now, and uh, there's definitely some buildup to the west. OK. Do you think it's moving in quick? Yeah, I wouldn't. It looks like it's moving pretty fast this way, so you might want to hang out for a little bit longer and check back in maybe an hour. Well, oh, um, oh, well, I'll hang tight. Thanks for the update. Try to call me back if it looks like it's getting better. Yeah, OK. All right. OK. Love you. Bye. At altitude, the aluminum plane is vulnerable to high winds and lightning strikes that could cripple its instruments. That's definitely not a good thing. Thunderstorms are pretty dangerous for light planes and cause a lot of dangerous wind conditions. And with no experience flying in these mountains, Morgan's not taking any chances. Might make it impossible for me to land there. I'm just going to hang out here and just wait this weather out. in the Montana backwoods. <laughs> Veteran trapper Tom Orr is battling the brush to claim every last dollar before the season closes. Well, boots are slick. <laughs> but the payday doesn't come easy. And finally, after a two mile fight to cross nature's wild gauntlet, We made it to the water. He's reached the promised land. That looks beavery, too. It goes way back up in there. Needs to be explored for sure. The first thing I'm going to do is get the canoe into the water and then go paddling around here and seeing what kind of sign is here. A fresh beaver chew. Surely there's some beaver houses in here. We'll just find them and find the hottest spots and we'll put some traps in the hot spots. And... All right, we're moving. Here's a couple of fresh sticks right here that just, they've just been chewed off. Well, there's a beaver house right there. This is the spot I'm looking for right here. This channel here goes underwater and into the beaver house. And this is one of their food lanes that they come out to get the food. This should be the place to set the traps right here. We've got the house. We've got the, all the food is stored right here in the river. This is a real exciting thing. I mean, when you find beaver sign, there's always an excitement about, God, what's in here, you know? All right, we got a good set in here. Let's go put some more traps in. The slough is so big, it's big enough to have two or three beaver families in it. A single beaver family can have as many as 12 members. At $200 a pelt, Tom's hard-fought gamble could be a last-minute jackpot. And there's a tunnel that goes underneath here and goes into that water over on the other side. Be an ideal place for a trap here. Tom's an expert at locating the high traffic lanes in this maze of interconnected waterways, a skill he'll need to maximize his catch. Back there. 
High tide is rolling in on Kodiak's eastern coast. I really don't know if this is going to float. The moment of truth for Mike Horstman's quick fix. But here in about in the next 30 minutes, this should get light in the rear end, in the stern, and if everything goes well, it'll start getting a little drifty. But to dislodge from the beach, the fully loaded one-ton barge needs a tow. a little hard on the one side. It's not floating 100% like I like it, but it looks a lot better than it did before. I think it's just, it's heavy, real heavy. So I want to get it across the bay as fast as I can. Mike's homestead is a straight six mile shot across the bay, but the currents are cold and the crossing treacherous. With this situation, I'm undergunned as far as horsepower. It's just a small motor, it's just a small boat. There's no hidey holes here, there's no, there's no real shelter as I go across. It's, I'm completely exposed to the weather and the elements. You, you just gotta pay attention here, you, gotta, you don't wanna get in trouble. in the Ozark Mountains. Steel is the stock in trade for bladesmith Jason Hawk, whether forged or salvaged. These are a portion of the pieces that I got from the plane. A recent discovery in the back country proved to be an unexpected jackpot of high-grade steel. This here, this is rusty gold but the scrap cables are thin strands of metal too thin to forge until they're shaped into a uniform bar called a billet. So in order to make this billet, I've got to tack weld all these different little cables together. Well, I got this thing about as together as it's gonna get right now. Time to get it in the forge, heat it up, and tighten it up. Melting the individual strands together requires high heat and compression. Just gonna go for some light taps. What I wanna do is make sure that everything's sealed up and that basically it becomes a solid piece of steel. But the process creates a byproduct called scale, small flakes of iron ore that are overworked and unstable. I've got a lot of scale built up on the outside surface, so I'm gonna go ahead and clean it up. An ancient Japanese technique of rapid heating and cooling refines the steel. It's a wet anvil technique. You wet the anvil itself, wet the hammerhead, you bring it out of the forge and hammer it. You're basically creating micro explosions. It's forcing that scale to shatter. But really, it's got a potential to go real bad real quick. Cool the steel too quickly and it can crack. Heat it too long and it'll melt. I'm almost done with the cable. Stock's getting a lot thinner. Forge is running hot. Yeah. On the Hawk Homestead in the Ozarks, ah, damn it. Jason's feeling the heat. So the steel got overheated. I basically melted the steel off the end of the bar. This melted steel is compromised. You're working high temperatures on the edge of melting. Um, it happens. 
which means my knife just became shorter. The remaining steel billets are stacked and welded more than a dozen times to produce a tight grain that can withstand the knife making process. I'm gonna squeeze these layers down, forge welding everything together, and start drawing that billet out. When it's about double the length originally it was, I'm gonna cut it and I'm gonna fold it back on itself. What it's doing, it's homogenizing the steel. So a lot of metal still to move. I'll just keep stretching it as we go. In North Carolina, Eustis. Hey, Gary. What you got here for us? Well, today? this is that bed I've been telling you about. It's the moment of truth for Eustis's plan to make a fast buck from a handcrafted rustic bed frame. I'm really hoping this bed will sell and bring me a good price and help me get closer to getting my down payment done. Look at the joinery. So you've got dovetail right yeah, here. Dovetail on the center there. Yeah. That is beautiful. And this is white pine? Yeah, yep. white pine. I could see it in his face that he liked this as soon as I saw him looking at the bed. How beautiful. Gary sees what we've done. He understands what goes into it. This is a real old-timey way of putting stuff together. Well, I'll tell you something. I think for something of this nature, I mean, you're probably looking at $3,500, maybe $4,000 <laughs> on something like this. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> This fits right up our alley. These type of things bring a large dollar amount because of the, the care that's put into it and the time that goes into it. And this is the type of product that people are looking for nowadays. We could write you a check and we could take this one today. That's what we need to do. We, we need to get some money pretty fast. We gotta make a payment on some land. Heavy duty, all right. We'll bring it around here and put it in the showroom. Cool. The sale brings Eustace's down payment to $29,000, about 20% of the land price. But he won't know if it's enough until he makes his bid. They say you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. That's where I feel like I am. Hey, can you believe that? That's pretty sweet, man. I'm loving it. in the shadow of the Great Alaska Range. <sighs> well, it's like I'm gonna be here a little while. What's a simple rainstorm on the ground could be deadly in the air over the mountains. The rain's really coming down now. Rather than risk disaster, Morgan's waiting it out, but the delay is burning precious daylight. You know, it's just too late in the day. I'm going to have to sleep here for the night. Damn it. Well, it is what it is, you know? It's like not the area where you want to push things. Now, I've been warned more than once about uh, get home-itis or get there-itis, where you're just more focused on the destination than uh, the journey. And in this case, there's no reason to try to push it. I think I can stick my pot under one of these drips and get enough water to make a cup of coffee with. Wasn't expecting to be using this survival gear quite so soon, but I'm sure glad I have it. This is not what I want to be doing right now. Uh, I want to be getting going, but uh, maybe this thunderstorm will move on by. So tomorrow I'll be getting up in the air and hopefully make it home. in Northwest Montana. No, up in a tree there. A hard day's work yields a surprising reward. Well, that might be a, an extra bonus here, not it? A rare 10-pound porcupine with a valuable hide and quills. I think I'm gonna go harvest the porcupine. All right, man. He's got 
good hair out of me. I can actually make money from a porcupine. I'll be able to sell all the quills I can harvest along with the hair and even the front toenails. You know, this is a little added bonus to the old trap line. Years and years ago, before the white man brought beads to this country to trade to the Indians for decorative stylings, the Indians used dyed porcupine quills. These are little round rawhide rings, and the quills are all wrapped around them, and the ends are all glued on the back. Lots of the war shirts that the Indians wore, like on the plains, would have one of these mounted on the, on the front of it. On average, a single porcupine has a staggering 30,000 quills. Also, uh, the hair has a value to it. The Native Americans used this hair for what they call roaches. Dancing roaches, it was a, a headdress that they'd wear. There's hours of plucking on that porcupine I've got to look forward to. But we're not finished yet. We've still got traps to check, and seasons are gonna close in a few more days, so, so that's all we can do is just try to wrap up what we got going and bring in as much fur as we can, and it looks like another successful season. Back in Alaska, Mike's two-day ordeal is nearly over. The pontoon is holding up, but it's taken an hour and a half longer than I had hoped. The barge is loaded with one ton worth of supplies, and it's putting a strain on the motor. Probably another 20 minutes, we'll be on the beat. We don't believe in miracles, we count on them. Once darkness falls, Mike's only choice is to navigate by memory. I know where most of the rocks are. But you gotta pay attention and be careful all the time. As far as I know, there's nothing in the way. I'm gonna take it up on the beach and unload it first thing in the morning. Finally, I can see the beach. I'm gonna start the tractor and tie this rig off. Mike keeps a tractor on the beach for loading and unloading, but in a pinch, the thousand pound machine doubles as a heavyweight anchor. That's all there is to that. I'm just gonna let it go dry and come back in the morning at low tide and uh, unload it. In the Ozark Mountains, it's taken three straight hours in the forge to turn a pile of reclaimed steel into a usable block. But the effort's not worth a dime if Jason can't shape it into a sellable blade. I'm trying to keep everything packed in, nice and even. I'll just keep stretching it as we go. The hydraulic press draws out the length. 
while the hammer gives it shape. More length, a little more width. You'll be there. So the blade shape's really coming together. I mean, it's just about time to start heating up the oil for the quench. Quenching hardens the blade by rapidly cooling it in an oil bath. But if it's done too quickly, the atomic structure of the metal breaks down, destroying its chances of becoming a quality knife. It's either going to be great or a loss. Anytime you do a quench, there's things that can go wrong. You just don't know what's going to happen when you're dealing with unknown steel from this plant. So if there's impurity in the steel at all, that thing can blow. So far, not looking like anything majorly bad happened. Grinding and sanding reduces the blade's thickness and gives it a razor-sharp edge. So I'm going to clean it up. Use a little grinding wheel. You can start, start really seeing the, the grain coming through, the difference, the subtleties. It makes for a visually interesting, interesting piece. At this point, you start seeing the character of the knife. The handle is carved from a block of rambutan, Southeast Asian hardwood. Handles are important. They're a lot more important than people think. They've got to be perfect. The balance, the look, everything complements each other. I'm really liking it. I'm to the place that it's time to sharpen this thing. Very light. Very light. Super thin. Let's go see what it'll do. Now it's just time to take it in the kitchen and test her out. Ooh. Yeah, that's pretty thin. Make a couple cuts. I'm pleased as can be. I don't know anybody that's made a knife with just materials that are from the plane. All right. You're going to be like that. What started as a bust for a hunting trip, I mean, it's going to turn in some pretty good money for my family. And that's really exciting because to me, the story is what it's all about. As a new day dawns over Alaska's Eagle Harbor, Mike's back on the beach to finish the job. I'm very glad that I got these here because everything that I did bring this trip is key to what I'm going to do here this spring. I got some gasoline for the generator and outboards, propane for hunting camp. I've got anchors for a mooring buoy, just an endless amount of loot. I'm real excited about the upcoming spring season when the clients are coming, setting up camp, looking forward to the hunt. The whole reason I live here is because of the bears. The snow's going away, the green's coming on, and this year, it's gonna be great. Delcy, come here. We got bears to hunt, and things to do. on Mountain Men. Marty chases the deep freeze into the revelations. It's a mess down there, but the bottom line is I have to make it work. I made it! Morgan's fight against starvation intensifies. I really want the fresh meat. My muscles just feel a little weak, but so far, no luck. But relief may finally be on the way. <laughs> What is it, boy? Holy smokes, look at this. There's a bunch of traps in here. And Tom sees in stalls right out of the gate. I'm up against a stump here. Oh, sucker. By this time of year, I normally have more fur caught.
in the Great Alaska Range. Morgan's narrowly survived six weeks of winter by living off nuts and grains. But with his rations on the verge of running out, a new opportunity could finally bring the relief he needs. Well, I think the day's the day. I gotta get these traps checked out quick here and make sure they're all serviceable before I take them out. Morgan's discovery of an abandoned camp two creeks over turned up an unexpected windfall. Four game traps that could catch him some meat. Oh, see if I can get this. If he figures out how to use them. Trapping is something I've never tried, and honestly, I should practice because every skill like that is kind of another arrow in my quiver that'll help me kind of survive. Seems pretty self-explanatory. It'd be nice to have some furs and uh, want to see if I can kind of provide for myself because I am desperate for food. So this is a conibear style trap. Ideally, the animal sticks its nose in here. Now this is bigger stuff like for a beaver or lynx. I'm not exactly sure how to set these big suckers. I know they're dangerous, so break your arm. If I know I can trap animals and make my own warm clothes as a matter of survival, that's gonna be an important skill to have developed. Okay, okay, I gotta let that. This seems to require strength and finesse kind of all at once. This is like a kind of a joke here. I found these traps, but I don't have any instruction booklet on how to set it. Here we go, I think I'm onto something here. Maybe this might. Oh yeah, Whew. It takes time to set those traps, especially when you're like me, you're not real experienced with it. Whoo, wouldn't want to get my arm in there. No one traps around here that I know of at all. I haven't seen any tracks or anything, so as long as I'm kind of responsible with my trap, I'm interested to see if I can do it. Hey Rufus, sorry buddy, you don't get to go. You, it's not, not a dog friendly activity. Having a dog does keep the critters back a ways from the homestead, which is a good thing. It gets me off my lazy butt. Oh, yeah. Can't hunt from the porch when you have a dog around. Morgan's plan is to set his first trap six miles away from his cabin, far from any dog scent that could ward off the game. I got to get up the creek there, and I think there's some beavers that need trapping that are upstream in my uh, drinking water creek, so I'd like to take them out. I'm looking for a lot of fresh tracks uh, of any kind of fur bearer. I also want to set some martin traps and uh, see if I can get some of them. But I'm going to go a little further, I think. Might try doing a pole set on this dead tree up here. I guess with martin traps, you put a pole up against the tree so they have something to run up. They're more likely to go check out your bait if it's easy for them, I guess. It's all theory till I see an animal in the trap. I don't have a way to know what I'm doing right or wrong. I might catch nothing and really not know why. I'm gonna use this as a pole for the critter to run up. Maybe I'll catch something. We'll see what works and then I can repeat what works and maybe, maybe get some animals. We'll see. I'm gonna use this piece of wire just to tie this pull up quick and easy like. I've seen Martin sets before, these pole sets out in the woods. Probably should have stuck the spring the other direction, huh? Okay, cool. Do something like that, that'll encourage that animal to go straight through there. I had some salmon jerky. Taking an awful risk with my food, but I'm gonna use it as a bait now. What I want is really to have this attractant kind of hovering out in space to where the closest the animal can get to it is by going through the trap. I've got some horse hair that kind of flutters in the wind and has like a shimmer to it. Well, we'll see if it works or not, but you gotta just be creative and use what you've got. To increase his chances of a catch, Morgan will spread his remaining three traps evenly across the six mile route he hikes every day while hunting for food. I'm gonna head over that way and uh, there'll be another creek I saw on the map and we'll see. We'll have to find some fresh tracks there, maybe some sign of something. I'm hoping that there'll be some good beaver ponds or beaver lodges. That's what I'm really excited about. Beavers, obviously a lot of meat and fur is prime.
in the great white north. It's Marty's first day in the Revelations, and he's ready to kickstart the second leg of his two trap line strategy. It's good to be back, but I've lost pretty much half a season. Well, today I'm gonna head out and see what kind of signs out there. Try and get some traps set. He spent the first month of the season working his old line in the North Alaskan mountains, waiting for winter to arrive here. But now that the snow's on the ground, he needs to get his line up and running fast if he wants to maximize his chances for a good catch. I want to get this line set in as quick as I can. So I'm going to push through in one day and try and make up for lost time and really get out as many traps as I can. Marty's looking to triple his usual pace and set his entire 30-mile trap line in a single day. At this time of year, that gives him just five hours of daylight. A huge part of the beginning of the season is getting that line broke out and getting everything set. I don't know how long it'll take. I'm hoping I can get it done in a day, but it's a big job setting the line. That's it. The days are getting real short, so I'm going to get in as many traps and as many miles of line as I can. The snowpack is 50 inches deep, a record level of snowfall that's making it difficult to cut a new trail. I'm stuck. Last year, there was no snow at all, and now there's two and a half, three feet of snow, and it drags and slows you down a little. I need a little more power with the old gal. I got a lot of work ahead of me, and I've got a limited amount of time, so I got to keep moving on, because it's all about covering the miles. What the heck? Might be boned here. There's no way. These lines just brush in real fast. A couple of years and it's almost like you never drove on them. I'm fighting the brush instead of having a nice clear trail. So it's a lot of work and it's slowing me way down but I don't have any other choice. Should be able to get the snow machine through here. Marty burns an hour of daylight, clearing the brush. Putting in 30 miles of line, it's not normal by any stretch of the imagination. It's a big job, but I think in the long run, it'd be worth it. So I gotta keep going. Now that's all there is to that. All right. again. This machine just can't cut her in this country. There's just so much snow, and then if I break through the crust, then it just digs down. It's four below zero in Montana's Yak Valley, but Tom and Nancy Orr are braving the cold to get a new trap line up and running. All right, are you ready for this, Nancy? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Competition on the line forced Tom out of the high country without catching a single beaver fur. And now he's shifting gears. We haven't been doing very good on the old trap line this year. So I need to do something. We're getting behind on the whole deal. Tom's plan is to double down on trapping pine marten by running two lines at once. 
But the only way to make this strategy work is to call in reinforcements. I've got an old trap line put out, and then I'm gonna go out and put out a new trap line that Nancy's are gonna go run. <laughs> Pretty right. good, huh? Yeah, very good. Alrighty. I couldn't have packed it that nice. You did a good job. You need a girl to organize I need you. a girl to organize me for sure. Yeah. Nancy only has limited trapping experience, so Tom's giving her a master class. You doing all right? Yeah. The way circumstances are lining up this year, he needs some help right now, and I'm the one here, and I'm the one that's also living off of our income. You know, and we are a team. We do things, we help each other out when it's needed. We gotta get after this and try to pull this together. Together, they're scouting the eight-mile loop behind their home for the prime spots to lay bait. Well, I think we're in the home ground here. This is probably the place to do it. Right. With Nancy helping me, I mean, if she's capable of running the traps all by herself, we've got twice the chances of being successful. The beaver bait goes inside, wired right in here. Up here? Mm-hmm. All right, set the trap. We need a lot more traps out. I got a lot of work ahead of me yet. Okay, here it is. That smells good, doesn't it? Yeah. All right, hey, we got one set already. All right, come on, Ellie. Got one box last now, so that's good. Does it lighter already, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Fourteen hundred miles to the southeast, Arkansas's Ozark Mountains are a lush forested range, stretching across 47,000 square miles of American heartland. In the early 1800s, a wave of pioneers departed from Appalachia and pushed the frontier due west in search of new beginnings. When they settled here, they thrived among the bountiful wild game and acres of pasture land. Now Jason Hawk is returning to his homeland in the Ozarks, hoping to forge a better future for his family. My name's Jason Hawk, my wife Mary, and my daughter River. We've just pulled up roots in the southwest. Dad, are we there yet? Not yet, baby, but we're almost there. For the past several years, we've been living in Upper Sonoran Desert in Arizona. The desert's a hard place. The sustenance living in a place with such limited resources, it takes a toll on you. Coming out to Arkansas, it's a promise of a different life. It's lush, a lot of natural fruits, vegetables to grow out here, as well as fishing and hunting, and plenty of grass for just about any critter you want to raise. If you want a homestead, it's one of the best places in the country in my mind to do it. Now I got to convince Mary and my daughter. I made my wife some promises about what Arkansas is going to be like. It's time to make good on that. Oh, what do you see? What is that? That's the house! <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, River? Woohoo! Oh, my God! Jason's purchased 600 remote acres including a 160-year-old cabin that will be his family's new home, which Mary and River are seeing for the first time. We get up to the property, and it is run down. Come here, wait, come here. Oh, my gosh. Come here. It is halfway falling down, pre-Civil War era house. Man, that tent looks super sketchy. <laughs> it's been around a while, but in all different places. Look at the patches. The tin is rusted. The floorboards need replacing. This house really needs a lot more work than I thought it did. It's a fixer-upper. It's going to take some work, but I figure I can reel her in. The barn will house livestock for dairy, eggs, and meat. We just got to have a place to store the stock for this winter. The homestead without a stock is just camping. I know, so many new smells. Oh, man, look at that roof. Just looking at the structures alone on this land, there is a lot of work to be done. 
halfway into the ground. Some things are in a bit of disrepair. Barn's probably the worst for wear. It's kind of overgrown. There's sections of the roof that's missing, portions of the support beams that are rotted, areas that are off its foundation. There's a lot of work. This is a beautiful place, but I'm not 100% convinced this is home yet. Any man who makes a promise to his wife about moving cross country into a place that has no running water, no electricity, and nobody's lived there in 75 years, your wife's going to need some convincing. In northern Montana, Tom and Nancy are teaming up to double the size of Tom's Martin trapping operation, hoping to snare enough fur to make up for the loss of his beaver line on Porcupine Creek. Probably the hardest thing about the Martin trapping is the traveling between traps. Quite often, there's a mile, sometimes two miles, between where you set one trap to where you set another trap. Hi, Mel. Hello, Nelly. I just got to keep pushing and, and try to get that line all out. Solid enough? Nope. Oh, you need nail, nail, too. Tom's showing Nancy the ropes today, but soon she'll need to run the line on her own if his strategy is going to pay off. It's a big challenge to get a critter out in all this country, and it really makes it kind of come home to me as to how much work he puts into this. So I hope I can handle it. He probably won't pass me that lure, though. No, but I'll, I'll pass you the basket. <laughs> Yuck. Hey, that smelly stuff draws them in. I'm telling you, it draws me away, but it draws those critters in. Sun-rendered fish oil. Ish, it stinks. Yeah, what happens when you're running these by yourself, huh? You better get used to it. Tom and Nancy are also setting traps for ermine the Pine Martin's tiny cousin. They fetch only $30 per fur, but every penny counts when you're making up for lost time. We've had a lot of ermine this year, which are like a little white weasel. I mean, even an ermine makes a little money for us. Even the little bitty skins that they are, you know, we've been sure short of fur so far this year. So everything adds up. I mean, it really does. There you go. All right, let me stick this back in here. But if I don't catch anything here, or if I only catch a couple, well, I won't make a living doing it. Well, then what? Two thousand feet up in the Ozark Mountains, Jason wastes no time in his mission to provide for his family. His first order of business is to find out how much Arkansas has to offer. Be good, houndies. We're pretty much settled in right now as time puts some meat on the table. I've talked to Mary a lot about the abundance of Arkansas and, and take away the abundance of game. So going out and being able to put some game on the table quickly would be a good step in making my promises good. Dry foliage on the ground is a challenge for any deer hunter. With hearing 100 times more powerful than man's, deer are aware of every footfall. You know, this is a totally different country to hunt. Um, I'm used to things down in the desert. But out here, it's a totally different ball game. You're making so much noise. My first step I'm going to have to do is build a blind. Jason's plan is to find a game trail, then hide and wait for the prey to come to him. I've come up to this sign. It's clear print. You know, you got a nice little heart shape, uh, hoofs, pointy toes. Uh, it's obviously a deer. I know they're in the area, but I'm looking for a trail that's showing a lot more deer sign than just one. It's mating season, and local bucks are marking their territory by rubbing their antlers on trees. There should be a rub in through here. It's a yearly ritual that Jason can use to his advantage. That's a rub right there. 
Rubs are meant to catch the eyes of does, advertising that a healthy buck is in the area. And that one is like a neon billboard in New York. With a rub nearby, chances are good that a deer will pass through sometime today. It's time for me to go build us a blind. To get a clean shot in these thick woods, Jason needs the deer to come within 50 yards, so he has to make himself disappear. Here, you're lucky if you can get 50 to 100 yard clear shot. It's close quarters, which means you've got to have your spot picked out just right. This blind here, I really think it could work. It gives me a great vantage point. I've got three or four shooting lanes, which is clear areas in the tree that I can get a nice shot without the bullet being knocked away by brush. Unless the deer is just a no-show, it's on me, not on the deer. I think this will do. I just need to come home with me. It does a lot of these everybody's mind. I sure don't want to disappoint anybody. And walking home empty-handed, it's not really an option. In Montana's Yak Valley, Tom's venturing into uncharted territory to give his season a jolt. Behind after six slow weeks on the line, he's been forced to adapt. For the first time ever, he's enlisting Nancy's help to manage a line of her own. Together, they've set up traps along the eight-mile loop that she'll run each day and are making the journey home. On the trap line, we've put a lot more traps up than what we had before. She'll be running this one. It's stretched out pretty good. She's got a good walk every day ahead of her to check them. She's looking forward to it, I think. <laughs> Look at there. What is that, Ellie? We set the trap out this morning, and we come back in this afternoon, and we had our first catch. <laughs> is what that, a trapper. That must be beginner's luck or something. Hey. Huh? Little Ermin, the only way few ounces, but that's maybe a real good sign of what it is to come here. Now, God, we've made fur, Nancy. Yep. <laughs> you got him. I got him. Everything adds up. I mean, even an ermine makes a little money for us, you know? All right. Drop him in there. Careful. Ooh, is heavy. Can you carry all that? I think I got it. Well, now you got work to do. <laughs> I think this will work out really good with Nancy helping me. I'm sure she's going to be beneficial. She always is. It'll maybe give us a little jump on the season. Who knows what the future will bring? We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Deep in Arkansas's Ozark Mountains, Jason's improvised a hunting blind to increase his chances of claiming some winter meat. So far, he's waited for two hours with no sign of big game. You never know. You read the signs as best you can, but when you're counting on game to show up, it's always a roll of the dice. You're just trying to hone in the best you can and give yourself the best chances possible.
I'm feeling pretty good about this shot. Her tail went down, and she went straight up in the air. Going out and taking a big chunk of meat like a deer right off the bat. And it's a good way of showing Marion River that there's a lot to eat out here. And it takes pressure off. When the larder's full, everybody's happy. Get her packed out here. Thank you, darling. Me and my family appreciate it. Let's get this bagged up. Come on, darling. Let's go home. In the shadow of the Great Alaska Range, Morgan's laying a starter trap line with the six traps he recently discovered. Working by trial and error, he's setting for a variety of potential prey. I set some Martin sets, but only four of them. It takes a little bit longer than I really anticipated. Now he's planning to make his final sets in a nearby creek where he's seen signs of beaver. I'm gonna keep kind of getting into this creek bottom here until I get closer to the tent frame and uh, hoping that there'll be some good beaver ponds or beaver lodges. Really, you follow any creek or any size for a while, I mean, as long as it hasn't been trapped out, and uh, you'll eventually find a beaver. Yeah, that's a beaver lodge, all right. Lodge here, looks like there's a pretty good pond there and a dam. It looks pretty deep right there, and you can see this is where the water's flowing through, so I bet that's where the beaver would be passing. It was pretty deep, and you could see the water was flowing through the dam there, and so that's probably a likely route for the beaver to travel. I gotta put these beaver sets together so I don't end up uh, hiking home in the dark. So I think what I'm gonna do with these big traps is put them on the end of a pole and I'm just gonna stick it right in what I figure is the beaver's path and where I can get it in the water and, um, and maybe they'll come to check it out. Never really trapped before, but being around the outdoors and reading books about the outdoors and articles and things, know enough about it to give it a try out here. But it definitely takes me a long time to get these things set. Oh yeah. Man, getting good at that. Now these things are pretty cool, but they're also kind of a new hazard for me. The amount of energy contained in the springs of those traps is definitely nothing to fool around with. That could really hurt me out here and, uh, and you know, put me in a real bad situation. <sighs> okay, our damn hook's hooked around here. I can't seem to get it free. Try compressing it with the rope, and maybe it'll come free. Oh, there it goes. Oh, come on. Got it. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do before I get the trap set is wire on the bait. Beavers like to eat bark, and so I figure that would be as good as anything. I mean, it's the best thing I can think of to use. beaver will come and try to eat the bark off the willow and hopefully set the trap off. That trap's in a pretty good spot. I like the configuration it's in. I can see it under the ice there. And I just gotta figure out where to put the second one and get moving here. Hopefully I don't have any problems with it. And uh, kind of getting late. That's a slippery spot there. Something new and gotta be extra careful. It definitely takes some time. I can't believe it's pretty much taken the whole day. I gotta get that second trap set up. So I can get out of here because it's definitely getting late. Well, that goes a little quicker when the hooks aren't all bent out of shape. Way to set that with that rope, that really works good. Went through a few different iterations before I find a way that kind of felt smooth and, and easy to do. Right. 
Okay, there that one's set. Yeah, it's already starting to ice up a little bit there. There we go. Got it right in there. Come on. Damn thing. Got It's 20 degrees in the Great Alaska Range, where Morgan's quest to find food just turned into a fight to survive. God, boots are full of water. I gotta get moving. I'm already cold from kneeling around in the snow. I gotta get my blood pumping and I'm gonna get my socks dried out. Damn it. Damn, I thought I was going all the way in there. At these temperatures, exposure sets in within minutes. Wet clothing only accelerates the process. I'm gonna head up the hill, that'll warm me up good. Ah, damn, ah, that otter's cold. I gotta, I gotta move and get warm. Morgan stays on the move to keep his blood pumping. He's racing toward the abandoned campsite 300 yards away to build a fire. I'm gonna get to that tent frame. Shouldn't be too far to tree line. Oh, burn. Temperature's dropping fast. Just a little ways ahead through those trees. Pants are all wet, my feet are all wet. I know as soon as I stop, I'm gonna start to freeze. It's well below zero. There it is. Oh. Oh, God. Oh, cool. All right, I gotta get fire going now. Fire burning in here, I think. Break a few branches off to build the fire on so it's not trying to come to life right on cold, snowy ground. Come on, there we go. Okay, I gotta get this fire built up now. Got some firewood while I'm still warm and get a big fire going so I can dry out before it gets completely dark. Cool. There you go. Can't beat that, for instance, firewood. Situation, I guess, but stuff happens. It's more about how you react to it. Maybe I should have just started a fire right there, but I had to get moving. I was so cold already. I knew the smartest thing to do was just to get moving. Last thing I got to do before I can relax a little bit is break off some boughs to sit on and relax on. feet wet sometimes, isn't that what they say? Oh man, it's a nice fire. The heat brings Morgan's feet back from the brink of frostbite, and it also becomes his lifeline as the Alaskan night plunges the needle to 10 below. Could have been better prepared when I left this morning. It was such a sunny, nice day. I was a little, probably a little flippant about hitting the trail and I should have had my, you know, my sleeping bag with me. And I don't think I even have my headlamp with me. I'm definitely not gonna walk back without a headlamp. I think what I'll probably do is spend the night here and then backtrack tomorrow. Get a little more wood in here. I need stuff that's gonna burn all night because as soon as that fire dies down, I'm gonna be cold. Still going well below zero at night. Could be in for a real long night. <sighs> Oh, 
A cold front has brought record snowfall to the Revelation Mountains, blanketing their slopes in 50 inches of powder. These are prime conditions for trapping, but not for getting around. With just an hour left in the short Alaska day, Marty is once again stuck in the high drifts. This snow is too much for this machine. It's a good trap machine, but in this country, it just doesn't have enough power and enough track on the ground. I can't keep doing this. Another delay that guarantees he won't make the day's goal. I didn't come out here to get stuck. I came out here to trap. I really hope I can get this fixed so I can keep going. I'm going to replace the belt. The repair takes time, but should give Marty more traction as he navigates the heavy snow. Pretty smoked out. This hopefully will help some putting a new one on. This is what drives the machine. And if the belt gets too thin or burns or smokes, you smoke the belt like I've been doing, and you don't have any power. So that's part of my problem here. There we go. Let's see what I can do with that. I got to get unstuck here. Maybe with this new belt, it'll help a little. It's all for nothing if I can't trap. The day's wasted. Hey, all right. Temperatures drop to six below after sunset. Marty's covered nine miles today, but needs to head back to camp soon if he wants to avoid a dangerous situation. I think this will be my last set of the night. A huge part of the beginning of the season is getting everything set. And I'm behind where I wanted to be. So it's kind of a concern. Getting stuck all the time really screwed up my plans for the day. You can't help but get frustrated sometimes. And at a certain point, I got to say, this isn't working. Last year, it was just no snow. And this year, I can hardly go anywhere. Everything's a gamble. I left my other trap line, and I might have screwed up. Arkansas's Ozark Mountains are home to large populations of white-tailed deer and waterfowl enough to help a small family thrive here indefinitely if they have the right skills. Jason's first hunt is a success, and his homecoming, a good sign. Hi, baby. Daddy's home! Hey! Got a little doe. The 90-pound doe will yield 30 pounds of venison, enough to feed Jason and his family for two weeks. Hold that if you want. You know, just put it through once, rigor is certain. A little bit more. That's good for now. Now that I've got the deer hung, I really need to get skin it out. The longer you let the hide sit on there, the tougher it can be to take it off. I need you to be a very good listener, because we got a very, very sharp knife here. OK. okay? I will not even put my hand in the way. Well, that's a good idea. Me and Mary, we like to expose River as much as we can so that she knows where her food's coming from and what's involved. Put your finger right there. Push hard. Really hard. See? Oh. Not well, bad. That feels nice, actually, inside. Really? Yeah. Does that it weird feels... you out at all? No. Good. Even a lot of grown-ups, they're kind of afraid to do this. Why? I don't know, maybe. But see, they weren't like you. They weren't raised where you know where your meat comes from. Yeah. So when you meet somebody that doesn't know how to do this. I'll teach them. That would be the best thing. Most kids understand that their meat comes from an animal and that the animal had to die. But they don't really grasp what that means. For us, it's important that River understands, makes her choices from there. Just get it all flat. And can you hand me some salt? Because it's going to be a little bit before I can get to this. Mm. I just want to preserve it. Salt draws moisture out of the hide and prepares it for the tanning process that will turn it into leather. And we're going to roll it up. Like a sleeping bag? Kind of, yeah, <laughs> I guess like a deer sleeping bag. Yes, yes ma'am. Get into this meat. 
That's a pretty good feeling. All right. Whew. What a day. Yeah, it'll do us for what we need tonight. Right now, I'm hungry and I want to eat. Ooh, this heart looks good. Yeah. Well, every little bit counts. Bet Daddy's really tired. He carried that deer a long way. Daddy's ways. not far behind you. Daddy's <laughs> worn out. Can I sit next to you? Sure. Jason is a good provider, and I trust him. When I first got here, I was skeptical, but I think it's going to be all right. Can I have the biggest? This was a good day. Now that I put meat on the table, we can really get to work. There's a lot to do here. <laughs>